This is Pat Soundbites Unplugged. Unplugged. The podcast where all the artists go to tell it as it is. Careers, music, tours, and more. And here's your host, the man that refuses to eat squid, Pat Calamari. Hey, Pat Calamari here. Of course, the host of Pat Soundbites Unplugged with episode number 64. As I continue to support this wonderful album put out by Mike Moser and the Go-Go Tuner family. And as you know, I've already interviewed Mike a few times. And I had Mike on the phone with rock vocalist Tony Cavino. I had Mike on the phone with rhythm and blues and wonderful vocalist Miss Lanisha Latimer. And we're continuing to support uh, the many tracks that cover feature this all-star lineup of incredible talent. And today is no exception. The track is called Changing and features on lead vocalist Mr. Phil Yuli, or better known as Guitar Phil, as in G-T-A-R Phil. And uh, another guy with a tremendous story, real good, really good story on how it started for him, how he found uh, the love for music, uh, and uh, going to Nashville. He actually attended the United States Military Academy up here in West Point. He's not only a singer and a very accomplished uh, guitar player, he's also a producer. He shares a lot about um, Mike and the album and has a way of coming across uh, very articulate on uh, his side and uh, on his role and and the record itself. And uh, you can catch Phil live streaming like a lot of artists out there like every week. And uh, you can see the passion on his uh, his playing and his singing, and he just has his love for music. You can check him out at G- G T A R short, I guess for guitar. G T A R Phil, P H I L dot com, and of course, go and downstream and purchase. Mike Moser and the Go-Go Tuner family. I know I got a few more artists that uh, Mike and I are going to chat with that Mike features on this incredible record, this journey. And uh, if you haven't purchased it already, I certainly encourage you to do that. We have more chats coming up. I'm a busy, busy, busy guy, and I can't thank you guys enough for supporting me. And if you like what I do, please don't hesitate to share, tell your friends, go on Facebook, whatever, Instagram. I certainly appreciate that. Hopefully you're following the rules, staying home, staying safe, wash your hands, wash your hands, and uh, we're all in this together. So the quicker we accomplish this, the quicker we can hopefully get back to live concerts and live entertainment. And support these acts another step closer. Okay, as always, live, love, and laugh a lot because life is just way too short. See ya. Yo, everybody, this is Guitar Phil, and you listen to Pat's Soundbite Unplugged. WBXO Classic Rock Redefined in conjunction with Pat Soundbite's Unplugged podcast. Well, I continue to definitely support and promote one of my favorite albums that was has been released. And I'm talking about my buddy Mike Moster and the Go-Go Tuner family. Uh, a, a great record, again, that's encompassing a wonderful body of work covering many different genres. And it's uh, showcasing an incredible all-star lineup and pretty much taking these folks um, a little bit outside of their norm. So if you're a rock vocalist, you might be doing an R&B song. If you're an R&B vocalist, you could be doing a rock song. And uh, it's very different, very creative, and I love everything about it. As I have featured Tony Cavino and we featured Lanisha Latimer, today we get to feature Mr. Phil Guitar Phil Yuli, who is uh, the lead vocalist on the amazing track Changing. How are you, Phil, today? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, Pat. How are you? Ah, well, you know, we're we're in the lockdown mode. Just got done watching our listening to our wonderful governor here in New York, and 
keep doing what we're doing. So uh, all is good, keeping me busy, as it's pretty easy to find a lot of wonderful artists like yourself because you're pretty much sitting home and uh, looking to chat maybe or doing a uh, live stream, which I, I did catch uh, some of your live streaming, which is really cool. So keeping you, uh, keeping you busy doing what you love, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I'm actually busy doing a lot of that. Um, and these, these are things that I've been aiming to do for about the last year or so. And uh, being on quarantine has actually allowed me to kind of clear out some space and get, get some of these new creative projects out the gate. So I'm a little, a little bit happy about that. Yeah, I mean, um, as much as it's a downer, there's a lot of opportunity to create. Um, as you said, maybe uh, more writing time, cleaning the studio, more family time than you normally would not have if you were on the road or, you know, producing. I know you're a wonderful producer. You work with uh, Kep Mo, Taj Mahal, the McCrary sisters, C.C. Wyand. But before we get into the record, uh, the Go-Go Tuner family, Phil, just to learn a little bit about your background, from what I read, uh, I guess you got to see the wonderful Eric Clapton on TV and kind of fell in love with the guitar. Tell me uh, about how you were uh, bit by this music bug and where it's taking you now to Nashville and uh, now becoming a pretty good uh, a known producer and uh, session player and uh, a cool guy. So give me the old background on Phil. Okay. Uh, well, I come from a real musical family. Uh, my mom had uh, ten siblings and almost all of them sang and played. Did you say and ten? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three sisters and seven brothers. Wow. Yeah, and almost all of them sang and played a folk. So, um, the music was, it just literally ran through the blood. And, you know, they were all much older than me. And, uh, I mean, by the time I was two, the, funny enough, it wasn't my mom's side, but it was my dad's side of the family that invested in me and my brother. I have an older brother. And um, my, my dad's younger brother bought us a drum set for Christmas uh, um, right after my second birthday. And that me and my brother's birthday is on the same day, so his fourth, my second. And I started playing drums at two. Sat down at the drums. It just, it was natural. I, I, I fell at home. I had people in my family that played. I always watched them. So I, I, the, nat the coordination was natural. Moved into drums. And by the time I was three and four, I was playing all the time. You know, five, six. I was playing along with albums. Um, by the time I was nine and ten years old, I knew I wanted to be a professional drummer. So I was going to go to L.A., you know, uh, sign up with Dildin and, and, and Yamaha and Remo and all that kind of stuff and, you know, do those things and, and be a, a, a big sex drummer. And when I turned 15, uh, no, right, no, I'm sorry, before I turned 15, when I was 14 that summer, I started, I was watching MTV and Air Clapton Unplugged happened and I was like, what in the world is this? this <laughs> <laughs> it just blew my mind, man. It just totally destroyed me. And at the moment I saw it, I was like, I want to do that for the rest of my life. But I didn't really even know that that was going to include singing. I, you know, I was around singing. Singing had always been part of my life, been in choir, all that kind of stuff. Growing up in church, you know, I was playing music all the time. And I had been through about five or six different instruments outside of drums, but everybody knew I was a drummer. And I was really good, uh, but guitar hit me, and I was like, man, if I had to walk away from drums wholeheartedly to learn guitar, I would do it. And that's how it started. And um, I kind of kept moving and uh, playing and, and making music, and I had been writing songs, all, all those kind of things that have been happening all my life. And, uh, you know, one thing kind of led to another. Uh, I went away to, when I graduated high school, um, I went to school not too far from where you are, um, and I went to West Point. Yeah, I see that. Pretty cool. And uh, Yeah, and uh, so I did that for a few years. And while I was there, I had an epiphany that, man, the Army is not what you really want to do with your life. You want to make music. And, yeah, I, I stepped away from that while I still had the chance to do it, uh, two and a half years in, and um, went on and came back home to Cleveland and dedicated myself to making music. And one thing led to another, and, you know, one gig led to the next and being seen by the right people 
school and um, I eventually uh, made my way to Nashville and everything was really happening kicking off from then. Very cool. I mean, with um, three aunts and seven uncles, um, did anybody make it to the to the to the big leagues out of all that talent? Oh, all of them. All of them could have. That's the thing. That they chose not to. Wow. I had a I had an uncle who was approached to be on um, off the wall. I had to play keys for it. He just didn't want to do it. Really? Um, wow. I, I had a aunt who wrote, who was, who's written songs and done music that people still sing around the country, and she, uh, she was kind of the the matriarch of that crew. Um, she was the oldest, and she was a musical genius. And I, I, it was they just kind of went as far as they wanted to go. We grew up in a in a more strict Pentecostal church background. Okay. So you know they didn't really look too fondly on like kind of chasing the ambitious dreams of, of you know inter- of the entertainment world that wasn't something they did they were more about using their music uh, to be in church and stuff like that and I was kind of like the, the rogue one that was like oh I gotta get out here you know get the Hollywood bug bit <laughs> so that's what they would call it so, yeah, yeah, like you, you're watching MTV and they're charging the channel going, no, no, no. Oh, man, I was sneaking watching MTV. <laughs> <laughs> sneaking watching this stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean? I'm watching Pearl Jam, Nirvana. Oh, my goodness. Temple of the Dog, Guns of Roses, uh, uh, you know, all of that. And people thought when I started playing guitar in church, they were just like, oh, man, you've been playing forever, and, that, you know, you, you play church. And I'm like, no, nah, man, you, if you guys knew that, you know, I'm, I'm watching, you know, Eddie Vedder and, and, and you know, a Slash. Those are my those are the guys who are, who are, you know, Stone Gothard. That's what that's <laughs> yeah, I'm in. I want, I want to be like them. And, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to them, and, and you know, I want to marshal and fling it low and, and a, 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 a left ball. That's what I was interested in. So, Lady Crap. That is that is really cool. So let me let me ask you this. So were you caught at home watching like uh, Guns N' Roses, which led you to mom and dad sending you to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, yeah. going, "Son, you need a little discipline and focus uh, here now." No, you know what? They never bothered me about it. They, you know, whether or not they knew I was watching it. I don't think they even bothered me because my dad, my dad really wasn't that strict. My dad listened to some of everything. He liked a lot of jazz, Stevie Wonder. Nice. Uh, you know, a lot of funk, soul. He was, a, you know, he, he wasn't nearly as strict. My dad was a college professor. You know, he went to he went to Columbia. You know, so he was a little kind of open when it came to that kind of thing. And my mom was actually the open-minded one of all her siblings, the most, you know, kind of the most hippie like So... You know, I mean, I, when I listened to gospel, it wasn't like, you know, putting down straight up, straight lace. I was listening to Andre Crouch. Okay. So I'm listening to the closest thing that you could find that sounds like what gospel is, you know, trips on acid. So I was listening to that <laughs> as close as I could anyway. And like, you know, by the time I heard Fly the Family Stone, I'm like, they just changed the lyrics. It's the same stuff. So, you know. I love it. What? Now, you know. Nashville, and I haven't been down there, oh my God, since last time I was down in Nashville had to be 1985, 86, and um, I, I love all kinds of music, even though our format is classic rock, we added the tagline, Redefine, which allows me to play anything, I can play any of your tracks, any of Mike's tracks, and uh, it's really opened the door for us, opened the door for me, and opened the door for our radio station. When I think of Nashville, I think of when I went down there, you know, it was all about, you know, Earl Tubbs and Hank Williams Jr. or Hank Williams Sr. And um, and then out of the blue, this country city USA has now evolved into music city USA. And I mean, from rock stars that lived in L.A. and New York, everybody lives in Nashville, so a guy with, you know, gospel and but a rocker, what drove you to Nashville compared to going to New York or L.A.? Well, you know, I, I went to Nashville because I thought the people were nicer. Okay. So literally, that's why I went there versus L.A. or New York. I love 
the sound of L.A. and New York, but I did want to be in the rat race gotcha. to make it because I was like, look, I've got the drive to do it, uh, but I don't want to be the guy that feels like I've got to cut people's throats to make it. And that literally was what made the difference for me. Um, I didn't want to be a backstabber. I didn't want to be, you know, doggy dog world. I would rather be in a place where I can learn the music business the right way and learn it, um, learn it cleanly, learn the rules of engagement, and actually uh, follow those. And and then you know have a career. And if I want to raise a family, I can do that. So um, Nashville was what won out for me. Uh, when it came to that, even though my favorite music had come out of New York and L.A. Completely understand, and it makes a lot of sense. And today is that that place, and I got told Mike I got to get down there. I wanted to uh, Nam the summer Nam was on my radar, and of course now we're locked down. That's not going to happen. But I really uh, Nashville is uh, is the new I don't know uh, the new uh, Orlando, the new uh, something out there is uh, you know between the sport teams and the music and everything going on there. It's certainly uh, the place to be if you want to be a singer songwriter but I guess the competition as Mike has explained to me you know you can go to any bar but you're playing for free and it's all about the exposure <laughs> um, and you're hoping that somebody walks in the door maybe from a label or somebody that says hey I like you know I like what you got going on here and maybe collaborate with other artists which will lead me into this uh, go go tuner family and the one thing that Mike <laughs> Mike mentions you I, I can see the smile on his face because he shared with me how um, you have a knack of articulating and uh, clearly his role in putting this uh, unique record together. So share with me, if you will, Phil, uh, your intake, uh, your, your outtake, I should say, on this Mike Moster guy and his Go-Go Tudor family and how you got the... Uh, guy's a terrible guy, first of all. Well, that's number one. We already know that. I mean, I, I talked to him for three hours. I talked to him more than my wife, Phil, so, so don't worry about that. I already got that down. But what, uh, what, 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 tell me about it, Mike, uh, Phil. Uh, well, yeah, you know, I, I knew Mike as, a, you know, CEO of GoGo Tunes, and, you know, he was a guy, he was very hands-on with the artist. I met him on the road with uh, Morgan Miles, I was her music director, and I met him through her. And, uh, you know, we started talking, and I mean, the day that we, the first day we talked on the phone, I was like, okay, he's a real affable guy. He really likes talking to artists. He likes working with artists. It's cool like that. And, um, we, you know, we start working together. And, you know, but he's definitely, I could tell he's a CEO, you know. Um, I guess it comes from the from the leadership training you get at West Point. You kind of learn what, you see leaders. You, you learn them, and it's something that's never left me. You kind of learn that. You learn the different, you learn the different, uh, you know, different styles that people have, and, you know, and I was like, oh yeah, Mike, Mike's a, a real hands-on leader, but he's definitely a CEO type, and um, when he said that he wanted to make an album, I was kind of like, oh, okay, cool, I got it, he wants all of his different artists, because he has such a wide roster, everybody kind of contribute a song, and then he's like, hey, this is, these are my artists, I want to present them and let them do their thing, I, that's what I thought he was going to be doing but then when he said well actually this is my record I've written all songs I'm arranging it I'm, I'm producing and I was like you're what and I was like okay so then I was thinking all right he's definitely going that he's going that route of you know CEO that wants to kind of flex his muscles because he's got <laughs> big muscle behind him right so they're gonna, everybody, everybody's gonna go in the studio make him look good it will be good. That was that was gonna be the vibe. <laughs> you know, fine. Hey, that's what he wants to do. More power to him. He signed everybody. We're all happy to be with him. So everybody's gonna be down. And it, you know, that's what I'm thinking. And then as we get to going, he goes, "Well, hit Phil. You know, I want to send you the song." And uh, he tells me he wants to sing on it because I'm thinking we're gonna do some guitar together. But he heard me on um, doing an Acme radio show and heard me singing and was like, man, I really want, to, want you to sing a song. So I was like, cool. And we figured that out, uh, how to do it. We finally got in the studio and he said, here's the song. 
uh, here's the lyrics and I want you to do your thing. And as we got going, I really realized Mike did what he wanted. And as he was, I was thinking, going in, all right, I'm going to have to just produce myself through this and play some Jedi mind tricks. <laughs> I feel like, you know, <laughs> the things that I wanted to get done to make sure stuff sounded good was going to happen, but make it, you know, make it feel like it was his idea. And as we were working, that wasn't the case at all. It really was. Like, now it was like a real give and take. Like, he's really doing this thing. But at the same time, he was gracious enough to be like, hey, man, I'm not sure what to do here. What do you think? And, and it was real give and take. And I was like, whoa, this guy, he's still being a CEO, but he's kind of this more of a Henry Ford, you know, uh, I want to learn every part of the business type guy. And, like, he was really as hands-on as he could be. And then when it came time to do his guitar parts, he was like, hey, why don't you produce me? I produced him through his guitar part. And we're going, and he's, I can tell as I'm, you know, giving him suggestions and ideas and ways to go about stuff, I'm like, this guy is mentally logging everything I'm telling you. I can see it. And he's, and then he would ask me every now and then, well, why would you do that? Why do you think we should do this or that? I'm telling like, hmm, great. And he's taking it all in, and then he's kind of keeping me up to date with uh, the progress of the album that was going on. And I'm like, this guy is really hands-on, really making this record. So when it was finally done, uh, we we all we met up in Nashville, and uh, he let me hear the record. And when I heard it, I was stunned because I was like, "Man, not only are all the songs good, you can tell that he did produce all the songs, but he put his heart and soul into them, and it came out to be really, really solid. It was like a really good effort, and it it lost that whole uh, CEO just trying to put a record together. It just was like a really well thought out thing." But the thing um, that kind of got me the most about it was he kept this approach of like this more executive, you know, boardroom CEO type guy. Um, you know, it, it's almost like if Richard Branson made out. You know, like what what would that be like if Richard Branson took his ideas, he's a visionary type CEO who's hands on but knows how to get the right people to get the job done, but still wants to have his fingerprint in every part of the vision because that's the only way it's going to come out right. And that's what Mike did. And I'm like, man, that's really crazy. And I, and I asked him when he did it, I said, hey, Mike, uh, do you think if you knew that it was going to be like this, you would have done it? He's like, man, I, I don't know. I'm like, I'm glad you didn't know because uh, if someone had told you, it may have kept you from, from being as... Uh, Having having the, the the naivety that allows you to create uh, um, in a totally different way that that made something really cool. So that that's my basic take on it, and and how he made the Go-Go record. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, what caught my ear? It goes from "Can't Find My Way," which I my notes is a really pretty cool rock song mm-hmm. and then we go into I had no idea who Morgan Miles is you know I'm not paying mm-hmm. attention really to the country aspects of folks in Nashville there's a million folks in Nashville but her vocals of not giving up I'm like whoa wait a minute here who's this and then we go into right. then we go into Go Go Shred this incredible instrumental you know and then you got changing when you're, you're featured a really great groove in a R&B vibe, and then you throw in Lanisha Latimer, and I'm like, what is this? I mean, who puts this together? And um, it's, Mike had to pry Tony a little bit. Obviously, he's known Tony probably maybe the longest as a New Yorker to get Tony to throw a couple curse words at how Mike could be an asshole here or there. Uh, Lanisha was Lanisha was great. Lanisha was, what a story like yourself and uh, a tremendous artist. Let me ask you this. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking that too, Phil. I'm thinking guitar Phil. But he's not playing guitar. He's 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 a vocalist. And with Mike, totally right. I'm like, here, hey, Jimi Hendrix, come on up here. Can you do me a favor and do lead on my 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 thing changing here? But let me ask you a, a, a question here, Phil. For so I look at Mike is writing all these tunes, and you know he's just in, in his heart, he's a he's a guitar player, he's a musician. How difficult it, is it for him to translate to you? He's not the lead singer on how 
the song is supposed to come out. Mm -hmm. How hard was that to, for you to say, all right, do, can I just do what I want to do? Or what's your vision with it? And where do I take it? Man, it, it wasn't hard at all. Because here's the thing. The song already had the music. And Paul, uh, it's Paul Felder, right? Paul Childers, yeah. Paul Childers, Childers my bad. I'm sorry. Paul Childers, my bad. Paul Childers had done such a great job laying the guitar down and all the music, uh, the bass player from Mana was there. Um, you know, everybody was playing. I believe um, Lenita's husband played a percussion on it, right? That's like true. everybody, all the stuff was, it was like there and the groove was so solid that it was kind of like, well, there's not a lot of places you could go wrong. You know, like, it, it, I think it already had a, it already had a framework to it. Gotcha. So, um, that was the first thing. And then Mike gave me latitude to kind of do what I wanted to do vocally because he, when he heard me sing, he was like, I like your swag. I like your, your vibe so much that I really kind of want you to infuse that on the track. So I was like, all right, cool. Um, you know, I just, I was going to interpret it the way I felt like it should go. And it was one of those type of things I felt like that the interpretation was going to be like, I, no, I really felt like the song was telling me what to sing. So it was, it was like, you know, the relationship between me and the song, it was kind of like I, I felt like it wasn't going to be too far off. And as I was throwing out ideas to Mike, uh, Mike was like, man, I really like that. He would just kind of tweak it here and there. And I'm like, man, that's a cool idea. So we had a lot of respect for one another and listened to each other a lot. And it was really fun to do the session. So uh, I think we were kind of learning a lot about each other. He was learning about me as a singer for the first time he had ever heard me sing live is in the studio for his record. Yeah, I, the, yeah, the only time I ever heard you know, was when he sang on the radio station. Yeah, so he, yeah. you know, he heard an MP3 of a, of a, of a, of a you know, in, in studio uh, acoustic thing. And then the first time I'm encountering him as a producer is right, right here, man. And so it's like, we're both in totally new waters with each other for the first time. And it was, it was fun. And I think we had that we had that respect and kind of that that love that that is important to make a good record. I think those ingredients allowed us to come up with something cool. Excellent. Well, it's definitely very cool. And the layout of the, as you said, maybe the structure of the song, it really wasn't much of a challenge for you as much as I think of it. You know, if I'm the guitar player and I write all these songs, but I'm not the lead vocalist, I would think that there's some sort of, you know, well, I, I was thinking this and that, but here you, you said it quite uh, quite clearly of how it was laid out and how it, how it all worked out. And uh, it's, uh, have you ever worked in something? Something like this, Phil, before, as from a producer standpoint, somebody come in trying to cover, not trying, but but do, do covering different genres of, you know, from I don't know R and B Americana going into rock with Mike Kevin, you know, with Tony in theory. Have you ever dealt with that before? Man, my first album was like <laughs> my very first album. I did, uh, I did it. I covered everything from like ska to um, to like you know like a Van Halen rock thing to uh, kind of a almost uh, almost like a, a, an Americana alternative sound to uh, um, like a Sting and the Police thing so I kind of you know Green Day I kind of covered a lot of ground um, on on one of my one of my first records I ever did and it was like a singer songwriter so I kind of covered a lot of ground before because it was just I didn't know that I could stay in one genre I was like I'm just writing the songs that I love and you know so I can understand where that comes from sometimes but Mike was way more extreme than mine was because he had a wider a wider arc and a wider swing than I had but he, it was so cool is that he's got from the first song to the last song they all fit together and he found a way to make all those things fit together like this is cohesive and that's really cool 
Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, in talking to Mike quite frequently in the last, I don't know, two, three, four weeks, I mean, it really does take you on this musical journey from a chapter one all the way to the end, um, yeah. which I thought was very cool. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, I, as I said, mentioned before, what a classic rock format, but I got no problem playing Change In. I got no problem playing Taking My Heart or even the Go-Go Shred or any of it. It's just, uh, it's so unique and 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 I'm I'm not a big, you know, more and more when I see Ozzy Osbourne hanging out with Post Malone, you know, all bets are off. They're, you know, everything's, yeah. everything's done. You can go from anywhere to anywhere sure. and it don't yeah. matter. You don't have to be that R and B. I got to be in that R and B genre, or that country genre. When you see the, you know, the Taylor Swifts and bouncing from pop to country, and it, you know, why it doesn't make a difference anymore. And I think that makes it probably a lot easier for musicians like yourself to do whatever you want to do. I mean, I guess it, it could affect radio a little bit. Not everybody has that freedom and luxury that I do but you know I think it's the new reality anymore I mean I don't even hear anybody say you know well I play folk or really Americana it doesn't matter you know that's just me do you agree I definitely do and and I said this 10 years ago I said that it was coming um, I said that musical tastes are going to change where formatting is not going to matter anymore and the reason I said that was because of the playlist generation you have a generation of kids, you know, my, uh, my generation and the kids younger than us who grew up, you know, listening to MP3 and and making mixtapes and and then now streaming playlists. So it, where it's like you didn't grow up. I didn't grow up listening to one type of thing. I listened to everything. And kids younger than me, they really, really did. We were kind of like it was anything on playlist. It's just whatever I was, you know, top 40 playlist is what's happening on Spotify or on Apple Music or on Google and or Pandora, and it's like whatever is the hot top 40. So after a while, the programming in their head is, I just want a dope record. So it's like when I hear an artist, I don't care what the genre is, I want to listen to some of everything. And uh, that that's really happening uh, on top of that. We're, we're globalizing much more as a, as a uh, you know, the world is. And people around the world, you go to Canada, you go to Europe, you don't hear the radio stations playing one format. The U.S. is one of the last places to do that, where everything is like so formatted. Everybody else, if it's a good song, they play it. And it's play back to back to back to back, good song after good song, and they'll be flip-flopping the genres all over the place. And you just, you just enjoy listening to it. I, I, I hear you, and here I, I got a phone call one day. I played, I want to say like I played Led Zeppelin, followed by the Beatles, followed by maybe a Stevie Wonder song, and somebody goes, "What are you doing?" I go, "It's great music. What's the difference?" That's why we said we're redefined. I'm not tied down to just classic rock. Classic rock mm-hmm. redefined, and there's such mm-hmm. great music out there. So. That is cool. Phil, let me ask you, producer again, wise, um, how difficult is it to, from a musician standpoint to switch gears to become a producer for uh, some of these uh, clients that come in? Um, what kind of skill sets does a, a producer really need that, that doesn't, you know, you're not, you're not, um, you're not, what's the word, um, you know, endorsing them with so much of your background compared to mm-hmm. understanding what they're what they want um, in the completion of their record how hard is that yeah I I, I, I see Jones did this and, and I, I listened to him when he said it uh, he said uh, to be a good producer you have to have a lot of love you gotta really have a love for an artist you have to have a love for their music you have to have a love for their artistry for their brand of what they do and you got to care about that more than any of your own ideas. Right. Your idea you can follow the flow of that. And I think that's kind of the thing that I take with me um, whenever I go to work with an artist. Um, I make sure that when we're making music together, that I, what I try to do with any artist I work with, because I play, I want to sit down and play with them. So if they can sing or if they sing and play, 
then you sing and play and let me grab my guitar and we will make music together. And I want to find where we can kind of uh, like an avatar uh, where, where they would, um, uh, the, I can't, don't remember the name of the creature, where they would, you know, hook up with that creature. Yep. And then, you know, that would be like, oh, not found my I think they call that dating, Phil. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness nice well but I'll tell my wife that but uh, <laughs> uh, uh that's what I try to do with the artists that I work with I, I just try to like really kind of get a symbiotic relationship with them so that I can feel their vibe and that they don't even have to tell me what they want to do next like I, I got you I already know where we're going next um, not so I feel like I'm some wizard or something, but it allows them to be more comfortable and to be themselves. The less they have to explain, the more they can just be themselves. And that's what I look for um, in a relationship with an artist. And then that way I can help suggest the right musicians, the right studio, the right engineers, the right background singers, help pick the right song, all that kind of stuff. And when they leave me, hopefully they are a better um they're better in their artistry or at least better in that the one thing that they were trying to express before they they got to me. good for you man that sounds really cool good for you I, I i get all of that and uh kudos that you've 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 figured out what works best for you but to, more importantly to play with them and understand their background and then you get it and then you can able to build off of that i see this ep worker b um mm-hmm. a collection of blues inspired americana leaning gems is it out is it can i play it or tell me yeah, a little yeah, bit about yeah, it or yeah. Yeah, it's out. It, it's on. It's on Apple Music. It's on Spotify, Google Play, Pandora. It's everywhere you can get streaming. Everywhere you can, your digital outlet is out. It's uh, five songs. Um, it was kind of my Hello World record. Like I said, I had an album out before then, but that was when I was kind of doing the Christian thing. And this was was really my Worker B was really my Hello World to the entire world. Like, yeah, I'm I'm really putting my hat into the ring to be uh, express myself as an artist so that's where that came from it was songs I've written and worked on for years and I was ready to release it in 2018 late 2018 we put it out and um, man people have received it well Excellent. Well, I definitely got to find that and take a listen and uh, play a couple of tracks and reach out to you to let you know that uh, we're playing it up here in New York. And, uh, oh, please do. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. Any other projects that I can help promote for you, uh, Phil? Uh, let's see. Man, I've got several coming out. I've got some. I've got, I got four in the kiln right now uh, with some artists I'm producing. And I'm getting ready to start on my new record very, very soon. Uh, you know, as soon as the stuff lifts a little bit, uh, we're, we're going to be going to the studio for my next record. So um, I'll, I'll be having some singles coming soon from different places that uh, you guys will be able to look out for. But I do have my my streaming. Will my I'm going to be going uh, doing a live stream concert uh, next Friday. I'll be finishing my Hendrix catalog concert next Friday. So that'll be uh, um, Friday at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I'll be doing stuff from Hendrix for about the next hour. That'll be on Facebook Live and on Instagram Live. You can see it on Facebook on Phil Huey, on Facebook, P-H-I-L-H-U-G-H-L-E-Y, and on Instagram at Guitar Phil, G-T-A-R-P-H-I-L. I love it all. I got to watch your last one where you were doing a tribute to uh, Bill Weathers, and uh, you can just see uh, you really enjoy yourself, and uh, it was, I'm sure it's great to see all your friends jump on in, and uh, you're playing and having a good time. So good for you, man. Congratulations on this track and working with Mike, and uh, certainly all the best and much success. If you got something new, you got a man up here in New York that can play it for you, brother. So I'm, I'm here for you. I, I I hope you enjoyed the chat as much as I have. Uh, definitely. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I will be in touch with you to let you know when the new stuff happens. 